uh, as part two neurotransmitters, if you didn't have as much of an abundance as you did when you first learned to start, it's likely that you need to get vasopressin and, neuro- and, and uh, uh, acetylcholine back into the system to get back to something that you were able to do. You underst- understanding that? Yes? So... Okay. Also the emotional state? Yes. In other words, uh, someone uh, really was brought to the depth of themselves and, and uh, with tears, you know, when they heard this music and it really was reminding them of something where they went through themselves. Now when they hear the music, it's possible that it reminds them of that emotional state because the memory is state-specific, you know, the music to the music as well as other things probably too. But So uh, another example of state-dependent memory learning and behaviour. The reason why I'm sharing this with you is because for someone to go back to a memory, to access a memory of something, it's important that, that you elicit components of their experience that were happening then. You know, the more that you can elicit, the more likely it is that you come back to a sense of remembering things that were occurring on that day. So this is one of the techniques that Erickson used a lot. Yeah, this is a major technique. This is a major technique in hypnosis and regression. Okay. So in order to activate more acetylcholine, it's not necessarily a need to change the chemical makeup. You just put the, the idea in. Let's just say some, uh, someone's uh, suffering with Parkinson's or something in this. They're really... Uh, <coughs> Uh, possibly I might remind them of some moment, in fact, when things were functioning well. And the more they were remembering that, in fact, the more likely it is then that they're getting the stuff they need. So I would work with the person that way. Another example of this, as you, you're really understanding this solidly. Is that what you do with uh, diabetes? If you work with someone with diabetes? So yes, what? take the person back to the memory, in fact, of working well. That's very important. I do that always with everything. If somebody comes to me for smoking cessation or something like that, that's one thing that I do is the person goes back to the memory of remembering, you know, being totally not smoking at all, but doing other things totally, not being aware of smoking or anything, you know, it's not even in their experience. And remembering that actually, and remembering the sensation of how that felt. Um, so another example of state-dependent memory learning and behaviour um, if you look, I, I, I've, I've given you this one before, but it'll really hit at home, so you'll understand. Remember the the example I gave you of a person who left everything to the last moment to do, at you know, at school, and then when there was enough anxiety there, they learned this stuff. Okay, so then <gasps> anxiety became state specific to memory retrieval in the exam. In other words, that person. <gasps> went through this out of consciousness they didn't plan to do it this way right? it just occurred this way but when the exam came along they like, <gasps> like this you know and actually so the memory you know memory retrieval became state specific to anxiety and so that's quite a common thing that's happening out there actually that then memory retrieval becomes absolutely state specific to anxiety and so what kinds of things does the person do then in their sorting style to get anxious a little right what kinds of things do they do? Procrastinate. They might procrastinate. Like, oh. They say they say no, right? You say something and then they say no and then they say something else, even if they're adding things to what you're saying. Mm-hmm. They're sorting for, uh, like you say something and then they're kind of looking for something that doesn't quite fit there. Or um, uh, they're sorting for difference. That's quite a common thing where people sort for difference. Um, it's very interesting. Anxiety. Someone who polarizes if you can hang on to that thought, someone who polarizes, um, it's quite, sometimes it's even difficult for them to finish the conversation, to wrap things up, right? Because they've been polarizing, see? And that left, the person's left feeling di- uncomfortable, not feeling like everything is complete at all. So that's another quite a common thing that's happening as a result of the person eliciting a state of anxiety. You know, to get into that state of having the ability to retrieve from the memory. You, you notice many, many people like this. Many people. You know, 
you, 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 uh, immediately you'll realize somebody's sorting for difference. You'll notice that their breath is quickened just a little bit. You know, you'll know, you'll, if you were the person, you would notice that the heart is starting to beat a little faster. You know, and actually then the person doesn't have access to everything. You know, like you do really when you're really quite relaxed. Okay. Is everybody absolutely familiar now with what state-dependent memory learning and behaviour is about? We're going to be going over that. Um, We're going to be uh, talking about dissociation and the use of dissociation as a technique. Uh, uh, And then we're going to be doing a a whole session again on hypnotic technique. Uh, so all through this, you're going to be doing various things to brush up, brush up on uh, technique and that. Um, uh, in the past, uh, uh, Libby has always felt that she's not had quite the ability to put her words to and guide somebody through something. She's felt that she's coming into that, you know, but that she doesn't have that now. And I know that she does have this to whatever degree she does have it. Uh, so during the components where we're going to be working in threes, it would be a good idea to uh, make sure that uh, somehow or other we trick Libby a little into, um, into, yes, into really uh, going, through the, going through the exercises because that is the way that we learn. And uh, it's a good idea to have a learning strategy where you really do put yourself into that spot to learn rather than sometimes pride uh, uh, remove, taking you somewhere else because you don't want to be in a spot where you you know, you mess up perhaps or something, right? So this is a limited strategy for learning, okay? If you um, do, I am a person that's motivated by anxiety, I, especially in college. I mean, it's like I wouldn't open a book till right before the exam. You know, what is this? You know, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And so how would I go about changing I notice I do that with everything. Okay. I've been tracking my strategy. Yeah. With everything? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. things that I don't really want to do. Okay. Um, so, well, the, f- the first thing is that the motivation to be this other way is that you have use of all of your faculties w- with this other method. Wh- whereas the anxious method, uh, people just don't have access to everything. Mm-hmm. See, that's, that will be the major motivation to want to be more in that kind of a mode. So then I you have access to everything. So just being conscious <coughs> then when I need to do something. So what I've tried to do is, if I know that I need to do something, I started focusing on how good it's going to feel when it's finished. And yes. try to bring pleasure as my motivator. Yeah. Better and also future pacing something to occur, Terry. So, that it, so, that, so mostly people who are operating on this other program it's kind of in the back of their mind and they're not getting around to doing it. And uh, the person who is really using the front of the brain right, to get things done, they're actually planning when they're going to do something. They've thought already, yes, tomorrow, that they're having, doing something actually and having it completed. So in, in More that likely when they arrive at that time, see this is part of hypnosis, okay, that you set something up like post-hypnotic suggestion work because you set something up so that when a person arrives there, there's some context that's happening that's reminding them of something in fact that transpired between you know myself and that person. So that when they arrive there, it's quite uncanny matter of fact. There's some things that the person's already been through in their mind that's triggering the memory of things to do. Okay? Okay. Um, you had something there to do for Richard, did we? Okay. Did you have something else, Terry? I was noticing in uh, using your brain for a change, he seems, as far as I've gotten into it, which is about three quarters of the way through, he seems to feel that if you know your strategy, like my, I realize my strategy is pressure. Like, I like to have that pressure. If, I, if you know that strategy, then to use that strategy. Well, you know... Um, but, but for me, it seems it would be more beneficial to develop a new strategy. So yes. I was wondering... Yes, I agree. I think that's true. However, I mean, uh, when you, ah, that hurt, you know, I mean, it would be like crazy to forget, you know, that experience, you know. 
So, you know, we, that motivates us as well, and we learn this way too. So, you know, everything is possible for it to have a use. And uh, we think, what is the most streamlined strategy? The, with the fewest steps that give you, the, you know, the elegance, you know, that you, you'd like. Okay. David, do you think there could, is, is it, uh, is, are there certain streamlined strategies that are universal, that are, you could kind of say, that are, that are like good for everybody? Or is it more to say how to, for a person to streamline their strategy, or like yes, KAB is a real streamlined strategy? Is that something we could almost on a universal say that if people can get by this kind of strategy, that they'll there's a benefit? Absolutely. In other words, in English, you will definitely want to learn to visualize a word in your mind and spell from visually imprinting a word. That's absolutely going to be worth much better than uh, a strategy. That's that's uh, that doesn't have that component. You mean just like the word dog, see D O G, or see a dog, or see both? Uh, to see uh, D O G, see the words, mm-hmm. see the letters. Mm-hmm. That's the best way, you know. Uh, and then the other strategy you mentioned, you know, yeah, uh, was mm-hmm. kinesthetic, auditory, visual. In your linguistic programming, you know, mostly they're saying visual, auditory, kinesthetic, V A K, and then we're flipping that around. I'm saying kinesthetic, auditory, visual. <clears throat> because if you are having a preference for how you're feeling first, then you're hearing and then you're seeing, this is a way to have access to the whole of the brain. So that, that's a more streamlined strategy. Mm-hmm. That would be to talk from seeing and then feeling like the latter. You know? <laughs> um, that might be a strategy that... Uh, a lawyer might use, you know, might work okay in a legal context, but might not work at all uh, in this person's ability to, to use feelings, in fact, or to tap into a person's feelings. The might, feeling component might be left out totally. Something could be very ruthless, you know, maybe. They might not have access as much to their feelings, and certainly might have access to all of the brain. When you say the feelings in this context, What is all that? What is all the feelings? I mean, okay. I mean, when I think about when I think about what feelings mean to me, that's a big, a big basket of stuff called feelings. Yes. Okay. So first of all, feelings might be uh, body movements, sets of body movements through space, which is proprioception. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So it uh, it may be uh, it may be a visceral component, a visceral and tactile. Okay, which is like the the uh, smooth muscle lining around the arteries and and the vessels and things, and uh, and then the, also the uh, Ruffini uh, receptors, you know, for a tactile sense. You know, um, may also have a component which is to do with uh, temperature. Okay, so that aspect, all that. Yeah. Thing. What about gut feeling? Yes, that's, feeling. so in other words. You know, when you have a gut feeling, sometimes, in fact, you know, the right hemisphere is wanting to share something with you. That's something like, <clears throat> like you say, well, I, I'm going to be able to jump across this, you know, but then your gut feeling is mm-hmm. saying, I don't think that, you know, you're going to be able to jump all the way, actually, you know. But the mind is realizing that I have to jump across there, right, or something. But the intuitive mind, through the gut feeling, actually, is saying, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> So actually, this is majorly the way that this hemisphere speaks to this hemisphere. Through our feelings, and <coughs> through the uh, inner insight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. David, in this, this book that I've been reading, this is a little off the subject for this mentioning, but she says that humans have thought of that there's been a lot of information that we have to get out of our body. And actually, what she's saying is that we've only maybe tapped into 10% of what's actually aware, the awareness level of the body, like being able to feel the aura, being able to move energy, being able to, um, just that's one example, 
that actually the sensitivity that we can pick up through cellular information, that we've only tapped a small like part of it. Like somebody who's blindfolded who can tell you the color mm-hmm. or something just right. with their hand. Yes. Right. And she's, she's on the car blindfolded. Yeah, she's saying that the, the feeling first, this woman doesn't know about KV, I don't think, or anything like that, she doesn't know about NLP, but the theory that she's saying is that when the body is really totally uh, awake, physical body is totally awake that it, we've got so many more capacities than what we, we think that it's the mind that has to wake up she said actually it's the body that has to wake up yes you know mostly the body is the mind's experience of itself mm-hmm. yeah I would always you know, relate the mind and body to be the same you know in oriental medicine when they talk about the organ and the meridian there's no difference when they talk about working with the liver meridian, they're actually talking about working with the liver. With the liver, yes. And it may not necessarily be that composite right. physical liver. However, it is. It's the inter- it is that, yes. and it's the energetics that flows through the whole system. Yes. And that's why there's never an ability to separate one organ from another. Excellent. Um, in other words, uh, somebody who has a problem, right, that with uh, bladder or something like that, okay. You know, I certainly would be interested in sensing you know, what degree does the person have ability to, for, for p- passage through the colon, you know. Whereas other, in an allopathic approach, they're looking at the bladder and kind of maybe treating the bladder, actually. Right, maybe only one aspect when, of the bladder. Yes, where, whereas I sense that absolutely the colon also is...